This video contains talk of crimes against children, including SA. Viewer discretion is advised. Hi everyone, welcome to my channel. My name's Anne, but I also go by my nickname Nini. I like to focus on Midwest true crime because I'm a Minnesota farmer's daughter. Today we're gonna go to Minnesota and talk about the unsolved murders of two sisters. This was requested by Kayla. I was born and raised in Minnesota and had never heard of this case. So thank you very much for the suggestion. And this could be a hard one to listen to because the girls were just 15 and 12 when they were murdered. Mary Catherine and Suzanne Marie Raker grew up in St. Cloud, Minnesota. St. Cloud is about an hour northeast of the Twin Cities and had a population of about 40,000 people in the 1970s. The girls' parents were Fred and Rita, who had a total of six children, four girls and two boys. Mary was their oldest child and Suzanne was their third. In the fall of 1974, Mary was 15 and a sophomore at an all-girls school in Little Falls. She was kind, outgoing, and had a sense of humor. She was ambitious and taught herself how to play guitar and piano. Mary was starting to look at colleges. Suzanne was 12 and a seventh grader. She was quieter than her older sister. She was very dedicated to school and tried to get straight A's. She played the violin and practiced two hours every day. She loved to write poetry and desired to be a doctor one day. She used to say that after she became a doctor, she was going to build her parents a big new house. She would even clip out pictures from magazines of houses and made house plans that always included a big swimming pool. Suzanne loved to give big hugs to her family. Mary and Suzanne were very close as sisters. On September 2nd, 1974, Mary asked her mom if she could go shopping for some school supplies. This kind of surprised Rita because Mary had just been shopping with her friend two days before for school supplies, but Mary was persistent, so Rita said that was okay. Suzanne didn't need any school supplies, but she just wanted to tag along and be with her sister. Their sister, Betsy, who was 13, was originally going to go with them shopping, but ended up staying home. Mary and Suzanne left home around 11.30 a.m., Mary was wearing blue jeans, a white sweater, and a green army jacket that had Raker embroidered on the front pocket. Suzanne was wearing navy corduroy pants and a white jacket. Both girls were wearing glasses. Their father, Fred, was painting the house as they left. He turned and they waved to each other, and then the girls started walking towards their shopping center, which was about a mile from their home. Shortly before noon, the girls stopped at Shopco, and the manager there recognized them because they were frequent shoppers. They didn't stay there too long and then started making their way to Zare's. Zares was kind of like Walmart. It had clothing, grocery, health and beauty items, and a food service counter. In Zares, when they walked near the food service counter, they ran into Jacob Younger, who was their 75-year-old neighbor. They chatted a bit, and as they walked away, Jacob said he heard Suzanne say something to Mary along the lines of, I don't want to go with that man. I don't like him. Let's not. When Jacob went out to the parking lot, he saw a man sitting in a blue Chevrolet Impala. The man was just watching people, and he looked really nervous. So Jacob got into his car but he sat there for a while watching this man in case that was the man the girls were talking about but after a long time the man was still just sitting there so Jacob left to go home. The girls were supposed to be back home by 3 p.m. because Mary was going to be picked up by friends. Her school in Little Falls was a weekly boarding school so she carpooled with students every week to get there and they were going to pick her up at 4 p.m. but the girls never showed up and this was really unlike the girls because they were good girls. Mary sometimes would sneak cigarettes, and honestly, I mean, which teenager has never done that? And she sometimes used to say bad words in front of her strict Catholic family just to kind of get a rise out of them. But they were not troublemakers. They were responsible, and they listened to their parents. Fred said, quote, We always trusted our girls because they never gave us any reason not to trust them, unquote. So Fred and Rita knew almost immediately that something was seriously wrong. They started calling friends and neighbors to see if anybody knew where the girls were, but nobody did. Around 7 p.m., Fred drove to the police station and reported the girls as missing. And this is so frustrating. The police didn't take it seriously at first because they thought they were just teenagers who had run away. They even suggested that Fred and Rita go down to the bus station with the girls' pictures to see if anybody recognized them as possibly buying a ticket that day to leave. But Fred and Rita knew their daughters, and they knew they had not run away. Fred and Rita spent that night on their pull-out sofa in their living room, but they couldn't sleep due to worry. Their four other children slept in sleeping bags on the floor near them, but would end up in the bed with their parents by morning because they were all so frightened. And this is what they did over the next few nights as each day went by and there was still no sign of the girls. And even after several days of the girls being missing, the police still didn't take it seriously. They told Fred and Rita they didn't want to get the whole town upset over two runaway girls. If they would have said that to me and my child was missing, I probably would have punched them in the face. 
So Fred and Rita were basically on their own. We could not move the powers that be uh, to get out and search, and we were told that we couldn't even organize a large search party. We didn't know it at that time, but we had we had a civil right to do that. They just warned us that we could get a few people and go out and look, but to stay off of private property. And that was the attitude that we had to face for all those weeks. Just a helpless feeling, not you know, not knowing what to do next. Our friends uh, would come over every day and say, let's go here, let's look there. And we looked in some of the strangest places. We grasped after every straw of hope that there was. They got neighbors and friends to help and walked through the woods near theirs. They put up missing persons posters and sent info to local radio stations to see if they could air something about the girls. Rita spent hours on the phone calling friends and acquaintances. She said this was the most horrendous time of their lives. It was exhausting and it was chaotic. It was hard. I lost, I couldn't eat. I lost so much weight during that time. I just couldn't eat. I couldn't swallow anything other than soup. Three weeks after the girls were missing, police finally began to think that maybe they had not run away. They ordered helicopters fly around and they got the National Guard involved, but there was still no sign of Mary or Suzanne. Isn't that insane though? A 12 and a 15 year old go missing and the police don't think there's anything wrong with it until three weeks later? I know it was the 1970s and times were different, but geez. On September 28, 1974, two teenage boys were walking around the Meridian Quarry west of St. Cloud. The quarry used to be mined for granite and was no longer used, but the pit left behind had been filled with water and created a good swimming spot. So the quarry was a common place people, especially teenagers, hung out. As they walked through the tall grass near the edge of the quarry, they discovered Suzanne's body. She was lying face down and her body was badly decomposed. They ran to a nearby house and called police. A few hours later, divers found Mary's body 40 feet beneath the water on a ledge. Suzanne still was fully clothed, but Mary was naked from the waist down. She seemed to have been tossed into the quarry, but then her pants and underwear had been thrown in after her, but they had gotten caught on the rocky edges of the quarry. Her army jacket had also been removed and thrown over, but that was found in the water. Her sweater and bra had been cut down the front. Almost two weeks prior to when their bodies were found, some teenagers did see the clothing that was on the edge of the quarry, but they didn't think too much of it. This quarry was about two miles from Zara's shopping center. Suzanne's sleeve had been pulled over her hand, and that made police think she had been drugged to where she was found, and that had caused her sleeve to pull over her hand. She had been stabbed 12 times, and Mary had been stabbed six times. Both girls had been stabbed in their chest and abdomen, so they had been facing their killer when they were stabbed. An autopsy revealed the murder weapon was a small double-edged knife. Mary's watch had stopped at 325, so it's thought that was the time that she was thrown into the water. Neither of the sisters had defensive wounds, so it didn't appear that they had fought back. But we have to remember that Suzanne's body was very badly decomposed because she had been out in the elements. Mary's body was more intact because she had been under the water, which was cooler. So it's possible Suzanne maybe did fight back and she did have defensive wounds, but it was hard to determine that because her body was so decomposed. And maybe that's why she was stabbed twice as many times as Mary. The murders obviously shocked St. Cloud. It was such a hideous crime. Police pled for people to come forward if they knew anything and asked all the people who were in Zares between 10.30 a.m. and 3 p.m. that day to come to talk to them. A reward was also set up for any information. One man said that around 2 p.m. that day, he was in Briggs Tavern, which was on the east side of St. Cloud, and he said he saw Mary and Suzanne enter the tavern, and they were with two men. He said one was tall and looked to be about 28 years old, and one was shorter and looked to be about 16 years old. He was sure it was them because he had seen the raker that was embroidered on Mary's jacket. He said Mary was laughing and playing foosball and having fun with the boys, but Suzanne looked uncomfortable. No one else reported seeing the girls in Briggs Tavern that day, and it was in the opposite direction of Zares from the quarry. And unless they were in a vehicle, I don't know if they could have made that in an hour, because if he saw them at 2 p.m. and Mary's watch stopped at 3.25 p.m., that only gave about an hour and a half to get there. And I couldn't find the exact location of where Briggs was. I think it's closed down by now. So I couldn't find out how many miles it was from the quarry, but Zares was two miles from the quarry. And I would think it takes about 45 minutes 
to walk on foot. Maybe they were in a vehicle and were able to do that. But other witnesses reported seeing the girls walking to the quarry. One man said he saw two girls matching their description walking north from the quarry around 3 p.m. They caught his eye because he saw Mary's army jacket and thought they were hippies. He kept an eye on them because they walked close to his tool shed and he didn't want them to rob him. This came up in another case I'm working on where it was in the 70s and people thought hippies had murdered somebody. Like did hippies really have that much of a bad rap in the 1970s? A woman who lived south of the quarry said she saw what looked like the girls walking towards the quarry around that same time because they passed through her yard. She said, though, they were with a tall man. These witnesses saying that they saw the girls approaching the quarry around 3 p.m. aligns with their time of death because the coroner estimated that they were killed between 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. that day. And also, again, Mary's watch had stopped at 3.25 p.m. So if they really were approaching the quarry at 3 p.m., whatever happened happened not long after they had gotten to the quarry. Jacob Younger, the elderly neighbor who had seen the girls in Zares that day, burned countless tanks of gas driving around the streets of St. Cloud, desperately looking for that blue Chevrolet Impala he had seen in the parking lot. What a sweet man to do that. The sister's funeral was held on October 2nd, 1974, the girls were buried next to each other in Assumption Cemetery. After their funeral, their father Fred said, quote, We are frustrated to think that two gentle girls who never could hurt anyone would have been so hurt themselves, unquote. Police did consider that maybe Fred and Rita were responsible for their daughter's murders. It's sickening, but it does happen all the time where parents do murder their own children, but they gave them a polygraph test and they both passed. Fall can tend to be a rainy time in the Midwest, and September of 1974 was very rainy around the St. Cloud area, which is so unfortunate because that rain could have destroyed some DNA evidence. You hear of cold cases all the time being solved because DNA technology advances, they're able to test that DNA and link a killer to a crime. So it's possible the girls, specifically Suzanne, since she was not in the water, could have had the killer's DNA on her, but the rain washed it away. There was just not a lot of physical evidence in this case. There had been a pair of men's glasses found at the crime scene, but the lead investigator had put them in his desk drawer and they sat there for 10 years. When that investigator passed away and his desk was being cleaned out in 1984, that was when the glasses were discovered. The glasses were gold medal and had been made in West Germany and it fit somebody with a broad face who was nearsighted. Mary did seem to be struggling with something in the months leading up to the murders. Two weeks prior to her murder, Mary spent a week at her aunt and uncle's house and babysat her cousins during the day. One day she begged her aunt to bring her to the bank so she could withdraw money. Mary said, quote, you can't imagine how much trouble I'll be in if I don't get that money, unquote. And on the day of the murder, she had insisted on going shopping, even though she had just been shopping two days before. So like, had she been giving somebody money and maybe on the day of the murder, she was meeting somebody to give them more money? When her bedroom was searched, her last diary entry was very ominous. The page had been ripped out of her diary and was found in a box of greeting cards in her room. That entry said, to my family, should I die, I ask that my stuffed animals go to my sister. If I am murdered, find my killer and see that justice is done. I have a few reasons to fear for my life and what I ask is important. That entry is so alarming because what 15 year old talks like that and thinks that they're gonna die? I think it also shows how young Mary was. Yes, she was 15 and she was looking at colleges, but she was still just a kid. I think it's really sweet that she was kind of willing her stuffed animals to her sister. Rita has said she does feel that the killer was somebody that the girls knew, specifically Mary. She said the girls would not willingly walk off with somebody if they didn't know them. Months passed and there was still no idea who the killer was. Fred and Rita said the trauma of dealing with the grief of two murdered daughters was overwhelming. Rita said they had to pick up the broken and pieces of their lives and go on because they still had four children to care for. Mary and Suzanne's siblings were obviously affected too. Some of their grades slipped in school. And I don't blame them. How do you concentrate when you're dealing with grief? Rita said at times it was hard to know who to trust and sometimes everybody looked like a murderer. One year after the murders, the case was still unsolved. At this point, police had looked into about 800 tips, but nothing had panned out. At that time, police said they had five possible suspects, but this would change a lot over the years as sheriffs and lead investigators either retired or left the department. Sometimes they would say they had a few solid suspects. Sometimes they would say they had one solid suspect. The only thing that stayed consistent was that they were sure the girls were murdered on September 2nd, 1974, and they felt that the killer was a local because the quarry wasn't directly on the main road. It was kind of back from the road a little bit. So unless you knew it was there, you wouldn't have seen it. 
When the FBI analyzed the case in 1987, they felt that the killer was a teenager since the weapon used had been a small double-edged knife. I wonder why that makes them think of a teenager using it. But that again brings you back to wondering if the girls did know who killed them and if the FBI is thinking it as a teenager, was it somebody's Mary's age? I think that does give a little credibility to the man who said he saw the girls in Briggs Tavern that day because he said the two males that they were with, one looked to be 28 years old and one looked to be 16. Suzanne had told Mary and Zarazo that she didn't want to go with that man. And I don't think you usually describe a teenage male as a man. My head has spun around on so many circles with this one. Years and years went by and the police still kept investigating every tip they received. In 1989, on the 15th anniversary of the murders, the sheriff said they had one solid suspect. He said, quote, we're still looking at somebody, somebody who came up in the investigation. We're just hoping that somewhere along the line, he trips up, unquote. Rita hadn't quite given up hope, but she said she did kind of accept the fact that it's possible the murders would never be solved. She said the killer was probably being punished in other ways and said, quote, no one, no one looks two girls in the face and stabs them to death and then goes on to live a normal, fulfilling life, unquote. He had hopes for them like any other parent does, and they had hopes and dreams for themselves about what they were going to do with their lives, and somebody just chose to kill them. About a month after the 15th anniversary of the murders, Jacob Wetterling disappeared. This is a very well-known case and received major national attention. I do like to focus on crimes in the Midwest, and that is probably one of the most famous crimes to occur in the Midwest, but I don't think I'm going to cover it just because it is so well-known. Plus, for me, the hardest cases to to hear about our essay crimes that happened to children, specifically boys. So I don't think I have the heart to dig into that one. Jacob had been abducted near St. Joseph, Minnesota, which is only about 20 miles from St. Cloud. Stearns County oversaw both the Raker case and the Jacob Wetterling case. The Jacob Wetterling case was so highly publicized, so it took up a lot of resources from the Stearns County Sheriff's Department, but they still had investigators dedicated specifically to the Raker case. I do wonder what made Jacob Wetterling's case so popular and the Raker sisters' murders not as well known. Like I said, I was born and raised in Minnesota and I had never heard of the Raker murders until I got this case suggestion. But I remember hearing about Jacob Wetterling when I was still in elementary school. In 1990, a new sheriff took over and one of the first things he did was get the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension cold case unit working on the Raker case. In 1999, on the 25th anniversary of the murders, Rita wrote a song about her daughters. It said, two young girls set out one day to buy supplies for school, innocent and full of life, dear children, Mary and Sue. They planned on two familiar stores, they'd walked there many times, but on that day along their way, somebody took their lives. For 26 days, their family searched on land and sky and pond, and then one fateful afternoon, two cold bodies, they were found. But that was many years ago, their story still goes on, that someone still is out there, we won't rest till he is found. Will no remorse be spoken, no justice ever dealt? Is there no speck of decency within his empty shell? If he knew one ounce of heaven's grace, then surely he would tell. With just an ounce of heaven's grace, surely he would tell. On the 30th anniversary of the murders in 2004, Rita's song was played on the radio to again try to keep the case in the public eye. Rita even went on the radio and pleaded with anybody to come forward if they knew something. In 2005, the girl's clothing was sent to the BCA crime lab to see if they could pull any DNA from it. They were hoping they could find some DNA and then test it against some potential suspects. But in January 2006, the lab said that the tests were inconclusive, but they didn't specify to the public if that meant no DNA had been found on the clothing or if DNA had been found, but all the tests against potential suspects were inconclusive. But like I said, it had rained a lot in the 26 days that the girls were missing, so it is likely that rain washed washed away any evidence. Also in 2005, Rita heard about the Vidoc Society. It's a group of people who investigate cold cases and the members are former FBI profilers, homicide investigators, scientists, psychologists, coroners, and legal professionals. Rita sent a letter to the society and asked them if they could review her daughter's case and they agreed to. Lead investigator Tim Desmaris, a care reporter, and a cameraman all traveled to Philadelphia to present the case on May 19th, 2005, which ironically would have been Mary's 46th birthday. They talked about how they felt the investigation pointed them to Michael Bardowski, and they also said it pointed them to Herb Notch Jr., who I will talk about a little bit more in a second. The Vidoc Society didn't release an official report on this case, but they did say they felt the investigators were going down the right track. So let's talk about some of those suspects that have come up over the years. 
One was Reverend Richard Eckroth. He was looked at in 1993 and in 2002 after it was revealed he had essayed children at a camp that Mary and Suzanne had attended, but police cleared him with having anything to do with the murders. Another suspect was Michael, who I just mentioned, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce his last name again. He lived six blocks from the Rakers and he was about Mary's age. He once kidnapped a St. Cloud woman at knife point and after he moved to Colorado, he stabbed an eight-year-old to death. So not a good guy. He wore glasses and his face does look kind of broad to me, but his eyeglass prescription did not match the prescription of the glasses that they found at the crime scene. Police have never officially cleared Michael, but there have been at times where they said he was not an active suspect. But like I said, that has changed so much over the years of how many suspects they've had and who they are saying is an active suspect. One suspect was actually Ted Bundy. I don't think I need to explain who he was, but his crimes occurred between 1974 and 1978. He killed mostly adult women, but it is thought that his first murder was of an eight-year-old girl. So the ages of his victims was kind of wide range. He was a suspect in the Raker murders because police thought he might have been in Minnesota at the time of the murders, but a gas station receipt proved he had actually been in Colorado on the day of the murder, so he couldn't have been the killer. Another possible suspect was a carnival worker named Lloyd Welch. In 1974, Georgie Ann Dreher was a teenager and had just moved to St. Cloud. A few days before the Raker sisters disappeared, Georgie Ann was hanging out near Zares when a man approached her. They chatted. She said she was new to town and trying to make friends. He said his name was Lloyd and he was a carnival worker and just in town for a few days. She asked him if he knew any good swimming spots in the area and he mentioned the quarry, so the two of them walked to the quarry. Once at the quarry, Lloyd pulled out a knife and sexually assaulted Georgie Ann. As he assaulted her, he talked about having fantasies about sisters. A car approached them and that scared him off and he ran off. And Georgie Ann feels if that car had not shown up, Lloyd probably would have killed her. She reported her attack immediately to the police, but all she could go off of was Lloyd and that he was a carnival worker. She was able to give them a description of what he looked like. Years later in 2014, Georgie Ann came across an article that named Lloyd Welch as a person of interest in the 1975 murders of the Lyon sisters. Sheila Lyon was 12 years old and her sister Catherine Lyon was 10 when they disappeared from a shopping center in Washington, D.C. in 1975. Lloyd Welch was arrested in 2014 and he pled guilty to murdering the Lyon sisters. The article that Georgianne had seen had included a 1977 mugshot of Lloyd Welch. She took one look at it and knew immediately that that was the man who had attacked her in 1974. She brought this to the attention of St. Cloud police, but they didn't think Lloyd had anything to do with the Raker murders. Police did acknowledge there are a lot of similarities in the cases. The main one being it was two sisters in both cases. They were around the same ages. Both were probably approached or abducted at a shopping center, but they sent Georgie an email that said the investigation was pointing them in a different direction. Now let's talk about Herb Notch Jr. He is the person that most people think was the killer, but just like Michael, police have not been consistent in saying whether or not Herb was a potential suspect. There was a time they said he was not a potential suspect. There was another time they said he was an active suspect. One thing that's for certain, Herb Notch was a giant piece of shit. A psychiatric evaluation on Herb said he had a, quote, fearlessly savage quality about him, unquote, and noted he was very dangerous and, quote, in the right situation, a homicidal individual, unquote. Herb was the same age as Mary. He worked as a beggar at Zares. He lived in Luxembourg, which was a very tiny town near St. Cloud. Mary and Suzanne's parents lived there, and Mary had spent most of August 1974 living with her grandparents. A Raker family member said there was one Sunday in August where they were sitting in church, and in the middle of the sermon, Herb and another teenage boy stood up and left. A couple minutes later, Mary stood up and left, and then she returned a few minutes later. Maybe that was just a coincidence. Maybe she was going out to talk to them. There were a lot of reports of homes being burglarized during church services in Luxembourg around that time. So it's thought, well, maybe the boys were leaving church to go rob homes. The family member described Herb and the other teenage boy as one being tall and one being short. And I don't know if Herb was the tall one or the short one, but that does kind of align with what the guy said he saw at Briggs Tavern that day where Mary and Suzanne were with a tall male and a short male. But he did say one of them 
mom looked to be about 28. And the family member said it was two teenagers that he saw in church. But people don't always look the age that they are. So it's possible the one he thought was 28 was another teenager who just looked older. Russ Platts used to work as a beggar at Zare's with Herb. Ironically, Russ was one of the teenagers who found Suzanne's body. He said he was suspicious of Herb from the start just because of Herb's behavior. He used to just sit in the parking lot and stare at people. He was always playing with knives. He was at a gas station one time and told the clerk, oh, do you want to see my knife collection? Opened up his trunk and showed him like 20 or 30 knives. Not long after the girls were found, Russell did go up to Herb and asked him flat out if he had anything to do with it. And Herb only responded by going, Russell did tell police about this. In 1976, two years after the Raker girls were murdered, Herb committed a very brutal crime. He and James Wagner, who were both 17 at the time, went into the dairy bar and liquor store. They got there around 9.30 p.m. 14-year-old Susie Dukowitz was working in the convenience side of the store while her father was working on the liquor side. The areas were separated by a wall. James and Herb entered the convenience side and James pointed a gun at Susie and demanded she put all the money from the cash register in a paper bag. Susie did and then they demanded that she leave with them. They all got into Herb's station wagon and Herb drove them outside of St. Cloud to a gravel pit. They made Susie get into the back seat. Herb pulled out a buck knife and then cut Susie's bra and shirt down the front. Both boys then sexually assaulted Susie. They then made her get dressed and get out of the car, and as her back was turned, Herb stabbed her twice in the back and she fell to the ground. One of them said she's not dead yet, so Herb stabbed her two more times. They drug her away from the road, covered her in some grass and branches, and then drove away. Susie pretended to be dead until she knew the car was far away. She then somehow managed to get up and walk towards a yard light she could see in the distance, and once she got to that house, those people called an ambulance. Susie survived. Herb pled guilty to kidnapping and burglary in exchange for the essay charges and attempted murder being dropped. How is that justice? He was sentenced to 40 years in prison, but only ended up serving 10 years, and James ended up serving seven years in prison. In 2016, Fox 9 News did an extensive story on the Raker murders to try to get it back in the public eye. They talked to James, but he said he would only talk to them if they disguised his voice and kept him anonymous. But I'm like, dude, what's the point in that? Because you were convicted of a crime. Your name was probably all over the newspapers at the time. You were in prison. What's the point in being anonymous? He also tries to paint it to try to look like Herb was the bad guy, but he always fails to neglect to mention that he was the one who pointed a gun at Susie. And he he also SA'd her. But anyway, he said Herb used to hiss like a snake all the time and talk about how he wanted to kill everybody. He said he showed no remorse when he was stabbing Susie and he said it was just like he was hitting a bug on his windshield. Fox 9 News did try to talk to Herb, but when they called him, all he said was, quote, don't bother me any fucking more, unquote, and he hung up. There are so many similarities between Susie's attack and the Raker girl's murders. They were both brought to a remote location outside of St. Cloud. All the girls were stabbed. Susie and Mary's shirts and bras were both cut down the center. Police did give Herb a polygraph test in 1976 in relation to the Raker murders, but he passed it. An investigator did reveal years later that at the time in 1976, he didn't know that Susie's shirt and bra had been cut down the center just like Mary's had. And he said if he would have known that at the time, he would have looked a little harder at Herb. Herb was released from prison in 1988, but he didn't stay out of trouble. He broke into an ex-girlfriend's home and sexually assaulted her. He was found not guilty of the sexual assault, but guilty of false imprisonment and burglary. In 1992, a woman claimed Herb took her to a remote location and sexually assaulted her in the back of his pickup. Herb fled to Arizona, and it's like, that doesn't make you look guilty. When Herb got to Arizona, he lived under his brother Steve's name. Steve was in prison at the time for murdering his roommate, so the Notch family was just full of a bunch of winners. Police tracked Herb down and brought him back to Minnesota, but he was found not guilty. Rita once said that she felt her only hope of knowing what happened to her daughters would be a deathbed confession. In 2017, when she was 82, someone called her to let her know that Herb Notch was in a St. Cloud hospital, dying from liver failure from years of heavy alcohol use. Most people felt that Herb Notch was responsible for the murders, and Rita felt the same way. So she wanted to confront him and hopefully get that deathbed confession. A deputy and one of her sons waited outside Herb's hospital room while Rita went inside wearing a microphone. She told him she was the mother of Mary and Suzanne and she had waited 42 years for this. 
Herb pointed his finger at her and said, quote, I give you my word, I didn't do it, unquote. Rita said he seemed angry and bitter. He asked her why she couldn't just put it behind her. Rita said, quote, because they were my children, and as long as I am alive, I'm going to be searching for their killer, unquote. That gets to me. There is nothing in this world that is comparable to a mother's love for her child. Why am I still fighting for this, for some justice here? But they were my children. I had hopes and dreams for them. We had four other children and, and they're doing well. And they had to grow up with the mystery of this all, you know, as part of their lives. That was hard for them. Our f family bears the scars of this yet. And I guess before I die, I'd like to see it solved. Herb told Rita he was going to hell, and she told him he still had time to make peace with God. He said he didn't do church and told Rita she was starting to piss him off. When Rita left the hospital, she felt no doubt that Herb had killed her daughters. She felt a little peace after looking into his eyes and said, quote, I had to see who my children faced in the last moments of their life. There was nothing left of him to be fearful of, unquote. I wonder if police did have evidence that pointed to Herb, but they didn't have enough evidence to ever arrest him. Maybe that's why they felt strongly that Lloyd Welch had nothing to do with it. Herb died on May 11th, 2017. So if he was the killer, it's unfortunate he could never be held responsible for the murders. Fred and Rita Raker spent decades not knowing who killed their daughters. Rita and Fred wanted to help other parents whose children had been murdered, so they started a support group called the Central Minnesota Chapters of Parents of Murdered Children. Rita was also one of the founders of the Tri-County Crime Stoppers of Minnesota and served on the board for almost 40 years until she stepped down in 2020. When I see what takes place nowadays, I, I just feel we have come so far. I feel good about when, when I see and when I see the, the kind of uh, public rallying around cases like that. It makes me feel good that we accomplished something at least. Fred became an ordained deacon in the late 1970s and was given the title of reverend. He passed away in 2012 at the age of 84. Rita is in her late 80s today. When asked how she coped with losing two children, she said strong faith is the rudder that's guided her over the years. It's been 42 years, but, but I've never given up hope. I've never given up hope that that there'll be justice for our for our daughters. I really do wonder if Mary planned to meet somebody at Zares that day. Maybe they did end up meeting two males and then they went to the tavern where the one witness saw them and then they went to the quarry. But one witness saw just the girls walking to the quarry. Another witness saw the girls walking with just one man. You really do just wonder what happened that day. What drove somebody to kill two girls and rob them of their entire futures? The Raker sisters' murder is still an open case today. Police still investigate all the tips that they receive. There is a $50,000 reward for information. You can call the Stearns Sheriff's Office at 320-251-4240 or the Minnesota Cold Case Homicide Unit at 1-888-234-3692. That's all I have for this case. Thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time. Bye.